Is there plenty good room yet? of every believer. So, we're in Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. Uh, we'll start at verse 4, just to establish the context. We're, verse 6 is where we'll be looking at, but uh, starting at verse 4 of uh, Revelation chapter 1. It says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come uh, from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and prince of the kings of the earth, to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and then hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so this is something, uh, just a context, this is John writing to seven churches in Asia Minor, in particular what would be modern Turkey. And if we were to go read on later through the rest of chapter 1, actually starting in chapter 2 is where he starts addressing the church specifically with Ephesus and all the way down to the church at Laodicea that we see in chapter 3. Um, but he mentions something here that's a pretty interesting fact. He says that God had made us uh, king and priests, and it's through Jesus Christ offering and sacrifice. So what does that mean? What does it mean? A priest. What, well, first off, okay, what's a priest to begin with? What's what was a priest? Yes, sir. A priest is a, is an intercessor between God and man. At least that's what, that's what it was in the Old Testament. And he, he would he would take the sins of the people to God and, and the days of atonement and offer an offer a sacrifice and it would be their sins would be covered for the year and it all had to be done through the Aaronic priesthood. Okay. Does anybody else have yeah, any kind of... Can somebody go directly to God? Say again? It means somebody that's, that can't go directly to God. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Yep. Okay. All right. So I thought, let's look up the words, because you really have two words that you come across when you think of priest. And then uh, our... I don't know if you guys can see that very well. I probably should have made the font a lot bigger. But your old, your Hebrew word for it is uh, Kohen. Or Kohen. And so uh, it's going to be, going to be with the last name Cohen, basically. That's what that, that's what that word means. Priest. Okay, so. Uh, priest, principal officer, chief ruler, and such. Okay. Is that the same name, uh, the, the modern Hebrew name Cohen? Yeah. yeah that's okay. what that is. I always thought that meant king. Okay. <laughs> then, uh, uh, this is this is I copy and paste it up my program my Bible program as far as where it would be found and the sources that okay so this is your Hebrew word for it but then also you have in your New Testament um, oh these are the 
usage of it that you find. Uh, there's 492 hits that you have, but there's only 447 verses that actually use the word. There's multiple verses where the word is used. Uh, well, between the uh, Old Testament and New Testament, I should say, I'm sorry. 492 uses of it, but 447 verses in which the word is found. There's multiple verses where the word is used uh, either at least twice or a few times over within the same So verse. it can mean either chief, ruler, king, or priest, or priest rather, which is why a lot of times we associate Cohen with the name king, with the word king. Okay. okay. So that, but that's just a Hebrew word. Right. Uh, this is normally what we would think of, uh, like, you know, Catholic priest. And then uh, for the uh, Greek word, uh, hieros, is that word, and it pretty much has almost the same meaning as a, as a priest. Okay, somebody uh, busy with sacred rites. And again, these are the usages, uh, the origin uh, usages of it. And this is normally what we think of when we think of a priest. Um, your Old Testament priest, here is actually what he would have looked like. That this would have been according from uh, Leviticus and a few other portions of the scripture, but primarily Leviticus as far as, okay, this is what he, he would have uh, gone ahead and dressed up as uh, per, per God's law. But again, okay, so what is a priest? What does he do? Okay, we see the words, okay, that just it just means priest. But, and uh, Brother John and then also uh, Brother Joel stated, okay, somebody that's an intercessor that comes between God and man and that goes to God on the behalf of man. Now, I know it seems kind of silly, but like, is that man sinful? Is that man wicked himself? Yes. Okay, so what gives him authority to be able to go ahead and come before God? What makes him so special that um, God chose him? Yeah, actually, the thing is, God established uh, priesthood. Uh, go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16. Actually, I'm sorry, it was Genesis 14. Genesis 14, I wrote that down. Genesis 14. Uh, just verse 18. Okay, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And then he blessed him and, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, uh, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him uh, tithes of all. And if we were to read on, we'll see that the king of Sodom actually wants to give a pretty sizable gift to Abram. Now, this is interesting because this is actually first mention of a priest in Scripture. Now, you see the activity of somebody of what the priest would later on be described to be doing earlier in scripture, you actually see it as early as Genesis chapter 4, but where the actual person is referenced as a priest, this first mention of it, and then this gentleman happens to be a king uh, of a town called Salem, which is basically peace, shalom, and then uh, it says he's a priest of the most high God. Um, that's pretty interesting. If we were to go in, uh, which we will a little bit later, in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews, uh, particularly chapter 9 and uh, ch uh, chapter following, we see that Melchizedek, uh, what it says about Melchizedek that he uh, doesn't have father, doesn't have mother, in other words, he doesn't have lineage. So in other words, he was just somebody that is not of what would later on be the Aaronic priesthood. In other words, he was just somebody that was appointed by God uh, more than likely, um, or maybe he might have 
died and made, made himself uh, a priest, but was a follower of God. Regardless, the point was this individual worshipped God, and uh, he was a priest of the Most High God. And so this individual, mind you, this is before, obviously, Israel was even, even established. This is before even Abram uh, had his name changed. Uh, this is following the promise given to Abraham, uh, but before he would um, have the promise reassured, and then also before his name would be changed before Sarah. And this is many years before, obviously, uh, they would have Isaac. But uh, this individual, so he's coming around, and then he gives Abram tithes, and then also as well, um, he's mentioned, okay, he's a, he's, a, he's a priest of the Most High God. Where would they have gotten that idea to begin with? Why would, why would this even be necessary to have an intercessor? I'm not, insult, I'm, trying, I'm, try, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence. I know this is very simple, almost pedantic. But I'm, that, um, I'm trying to get you guys to think a little bit. Yes? Christ hadn't made a sacrifice yet. So the priest was interceding. Yes. Yeah, basically. Okay, so, yes. Because we're I just like, I was thinking of, of uh, Isaiah when he saw the vision of the Most High God and he fell down on his face. He was unworthy to, to appear before God until God touched him with the hot coal, touched his mouth. And we are unworthy to appear before God except apart from Jesus Christ. Okay. Basically, our sin has separated us from God. The whole issue why we even would need uh, not just intercession, but what we'd also need sacrifice to begin with to come before God is because of our sin. Uh, so our sin has separated us between us and God. Now, he established in his worship uh, an intercessor, the, 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 the mediator. Mediator. So he, he established a person to act as a go-between. Now, mind you, the individual that would be acting as a go-between is just as sinful and just as needful of God's forgiveness and cleansing as the people that he's going on God's behalf for. In other words, he, he's not any better than these individuals. Uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Go down to verse, uh, well, the start of verse 22. Start of verse 22. He's just finished recounting to them when God gave the actual law, what we would consider the, the Ten Commandments. Um, okay, and then these words the Lord spake unto all the assembly in the mount. Out of the midst of fire, out of the cloud, and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. And it came to pass, when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And ye said, Behold, the Lord, your, the Lord our God hath showed us, his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. It's like, wow, okay, that's really cool. Now, therefore, we should, uh, excuse me, now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. Uh, for who is there of all flesh that hath heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Okay, I'm just going to stop there for a little bit. 
Isn't that kind of like a silly question? I mean, I know it's it seems kind of legitimate, but isn't that kind of a silly question? Who has seen God or who has heard God and lived? Well, didn't just didn't they? <laughs> well, yeah. Historically, you could say, okay, who has before? Okay, but the fact is, it's like, okay, they they just admitted a few verses earlier. They said that, uh, you know, and, and then you see, behold, up, um, behold, the Lord our uh, our God hath in verse twenty four. Uh, had showed us his glory and his greatness, and have, um, we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. Okay? So it's possible. They acknowledge, wow, okay, wait a minute, it's possible for us to be able to communicate with God and live and survive. And then they go down and say, like, well, hey, you know what, Moses, you go before us, and you go to God on our behalf, because uh, if we continue hearing God's voice, then we're going to die, you know, because who, who, who survived? Well, I mean, they just admitted that they survived. And they'd seen that, hey, it's possible for a man to be able to go ahead and have communication with God and relationship with God and live. So, to me, I would think, you know, if that's possible, why wouldn't you want that? I mean, what would be a motivating factor for you to not want to draw an eye to God if it's possible for you to be able to draw an eye to God? You want to go your own way? Yeah, because you're a rebel. Basically, you want to do your own thing, you want to remain in your sin. That's not outright stated, but that's what you would have to conclude. Okay, so here's here's Moses. It says, and okay, so um, verse 27, it says, Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say, and speak thou unto um, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. Okay? And the Lord heard the voice of your words. When ye spake unto me, and the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. So it's true, it's legitimate, it's factual that, hey, you know, you're going to see God in his glory, you're not going to survive it. In other words, God's, God's wonderful, God's majestic. And it's the same as with Isaiah, as Brother John had pointed out. You know, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and dwell amongst people of unclean lips. Uh, that, that's a natural response. Even John in Revelation, this is, you know, he writes of himself, of, you know, being the, the apostle whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, he was the one that was out of the three, uh, I believe, the closest, you know, he leaned upon his breast. Uh, he was uh, one of the ones that run towards the empty tomb whenever they first got notice, along with Peter. And then, um, he would, you know, he, he God used him mightily to be able to pen, you know, not you know, first, second, third John, but also the Revelation and then uh, the, the Gospel of John. Um, and we read in Revelation one that when he had heard the voice and that he saw, you know, basically the man robed in white, uh, his hair is, is white as is woolly, and then his feet are burnt brass. Uh, he, he just saw the sight, heard his voice, and then he f it says specifically, uh, his own testimony is that he fell at his feet as a dead man. So in other words, that's <laughs> the great fear and terrible sight of the Lord. And this is somebody that had company with the Lord uh, three and a half years and was very close to the Lord. And so, yeah, it's an awesome thing. It's an awe-inspired thing, terrifying thing as far as to be before God in his glory. And so God's, God's assessment of them is that, okay, yeah, they, they've well spoken that. But here, here, what he says in, in verse 29, he says, Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. And then later on he's going to tell them, okay, go back into your tents and such. But uh, God's desire was that they had an actual heart for him and that they desired to keep his law, that they had a desire to draw an eye and to actually be obedient because uh, he would bless them, he would, you know, he wanted, he wants to have a relationship. He wants to be there, close with them, but they don't desire that, and that's why he cries out, "Oh, that they had such a heart for that." And so, what made Moses different than the children that he represented, the children of Israel that he represented? I mean, I know he had the call of God on him. Okay, so yeah, you can say that, 
but what what was really much different about it? Well, the Bible says he was a friend of God, but uh, it was actually David that, was, that God called a man after his own heart. But he obviously had a desire to, to serve God. It was basically comes down to his heart, his heart's desire. I mean, the fact was, he's still a wicked man. He murdered an Egyptian. Uh, we know he had anger issues. He had lost his temper multiple times, not only in his youth, but also as an old man. So much so that <laughs> he lost the privilege to be able to go ahead and lead the children of Israel into the promised land. He couldn't even go. He forfeited, basically, going into the promised land in his lifetime over losing his anger, over lose, or losing his temper, you know, over displaying his anger. Uh, and this is somebody, okay, he, by this point, he had already company, you know, seen God work great miracles, uh, has a close relationship with God, and then here he's goes do some foolish and silly to go ahead and lose his temper the way he did uh, when God told him how to speak to the rock, but rather he can go ahead and smote it basically chiding the children of Israel and then uh, undo what God had wanted to uh, do through him, through that. Nevertheless, the point is, is he's not different. Okay, Yeah, he had a call on his life, uh, but the fact was he was like any of the others. Like it says in James that uh, about Elijah, that he was a man of like passions. He wasn't really much different. The fact was, what made him different was that he had a heart that says, okay, God, I want you, I want to know you, I desire you, I want to draw an eye to you. Okay, because the fact was, God would have done the same thing as far as approaching Israel as a nation close one-on-one -on -one, so they wouldn't have had an intermediary. Uh, I believe that's established so that we have a pattern and a picture of what Christ was going to be and going to do as with the worship system that he established and that he gave. Uh, you see that um, even from the beginning in Genesis chapter 4 where they're sacrificing and bringing sacrifices before God and then he finds one type of sacrifice acceptable and then another not. So where would they have learned that? Obviously it would have been from God. So uh, you know, you have that aspect but the fact was he had a heart to draw an eye to God. They didn't. And as a result, okay, so now you have this intermediary individual. And then as well, I believe, is for the picture that they're going to show down the road with regard to um, what Christ not only was, but also um, what, you know, what we were going to be because as a result of Christ. So God in Revelation tells us here that uh, he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Right? So we've seen, okay, a priest, somebody comes before God, intercesses on the behalf of people to God. And what distinguishes, again, a priest from the others? By authority, by God's law, he had the right to be able to come before God. Now, the high priest himself was the one that was allowed to go in to the holiest of holies uh, when offering uh, the yearly sacrifice. But they had, they had, a, they had a closer uh, access to God than what the regulars I guess what the common people would have had. Um, so it's it, the issue is that they have an access to God. Go to First Peter, First Peter chapter two. Or excuse me, First Peter. Yeah, First Peter two. First Peter two. Uh, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Okay, so we are considered a holy priesthood, not just in Revelation, but as here as well as it states in Peter that we're a holy priesthood. Okay, not just any kind of priesthood, but we're a holy priesthood. So we're set apart, obviously, from the world, but to God as a priesthood 
And one of the many things as far as the priests would do was to bring sacrifices. Now, the sacrifices in old time were of animals to be able to make atonement for sin, but it wasn't permanent atonement. That's, that's why Christ had, would have to come, offer himself <coughs> once for all, and then his, his sacrifice would do away with that whole system altogether. So now, um, even though we are a priesthood, what kind of sacrifices would we offer? Since there's no need for blood sacrifices to make atonement for sin. What's that? Yeah, we're going we're to really look at that one as well. Um, here it says that uh, spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. Okay, so there's multiple. It doesn't specify as to what these spiritual sacrifices are. Uh, go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Uh, starting at uh, verse 10. Well, verse 9, verse 9. It says, Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them uh, that have been occupied therein. Okay, we have an altar where they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Uh, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate, or outside of outside of the gate of the city. Okay, let us the, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, or outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Uh, for we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Uh, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, uh, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks uh, to his name. And then as well it says, uh, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. All right, so he, uh, context here, writer is writing to Jewish believers that are turning back to Judaism because they're first off being persecuted uh, for being Jews by the Gentiles, and then as well they're being ostracized, uh, and even in some cases probably killed off by not only just family members, but as well as the Jewish community for abandoning them in a sense and turning to Christ, who is seen as an enemy, even though Christ was Messiah, and that he as well as, um, you know, he's Jewish himself. Um, so he writes to them, and basically the, the writer is admonishing them, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit, Christ is better than. So he puts forth the argument, Christ is better than the angels, Christ is better than Moses, Christ is better than Joshua, Christ is better than the high priestly system, uh, and then, um, you know, you have a cloud of witnesses, be, you know, from chapter 11 to <coughs> 12, so don't quit. And as well as that, you need to have faith and patience. Uh, that's another underlying theme that you have in this book. And he addresses him here, he says in verse 10, We have an altar where they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Now again, I, this is referencing the fact that the priests and those that were of uh, Levitical tribe were responsible for worship and maintaining the temple and maintaining uh, the house of God. And so um, he says to them, now what tribes were these people from? No, the, the writer's writing to scattered Jews. All the tribes. Yeah. So he doesn't specify as to which particular tribe. So if he was addressing them as far as Levitical law, the only ones that it would really pertain to as far as saying, okay, you guys are responsible, or you have, you know, altar work or whatnot, would, they would have to be from Levi. But here he says, okay, we have an altar, including himself, uh, where they have no right to eat which served the tabernacle. So in other words, 
our altar and our worship is a lot better than what you have going back. See, the thing is, it's weak and beggarly what, they, what they're going back to because they're still looking towards something that God already said, hey, hey this, is, this is already, I, I, I sent my son. You know, he's a perfect sacrifice. So you don't, you know, if you reject him, what do you have to turn to? Nothing. You don't have, you don't have anything. There's no substance to what you're turning to. And it's because the substance is in him. I right, good morning. Um, and so he's referencing also the fact that, hey, wait a minute. What, you know, don't you have to be from Levi if you're going to be worshiping? Well, not worshiping God, but rather if you're going to be in the service of worship. Yeah, you would. So the fact that, okay, we have an altar. In other words, we, all of us as believers, we are priests. Okay, so in other words, we have a responsibility. We are able to go ahead and go to God uh, directly. Okay, we have direct access to God. Uh, verse 15. Okay, it says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. And then he defines what that is as far as uh, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And then as well, he mentions in verse 16, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. And he considers those sacrifices as well. So these are a little bit more elaborated as far as what we read earlier, that the sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices that we would read in First Peter. So what are some spiritual sacrifices that we can offer? Praise, giving thanks, and as well as communicating. Now the communicating here uh, is referencing the fact that you are giving. In other words, you're giving... Uh, well, monetarily primarily, but as well as you're giving of your time, you're giving of your life, you're giving of, of for service. So being a giver and then giving thanks, being thankful, being um, somebody that praises God, these are sacrifices that you give to God now as somebody that has direct access to God. Go to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. You know what? Let's go up to verse 14, and then we'll read down through 25. Okay, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, uh, for after that he hath uh, said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Okay, now there, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. And here's going to come the admonition. Uh, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke <clears throat> unto love and to good works. And this is a means by which you go do that. It's not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, uh, but exhorting one another and so much the more see the day approaching. So, because we have direct access to God, because now since when Christ offered himself, and not only just offered himself by dying, but as well in the third day that he rose again from the dead, that he um, basically opened, made the way for us to be able to go ahead and have go to heaven now, rather than just being a paradise. We're admonished here, it says in verse 19, let us draw near, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Now I know it seems kind of silly, but draw near to who or to what? Let us draw near to who or to what? God, yeah, okay. So the, the admonishment there is, let us draw nigh to God. 
get close to God. You have direct access to him. You don't have to fear him. Now, mind you, I know we're supposed to, you know, be fearful of the Lord, and it's an awful and fearful thing to be able to stand before God in his glory. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, but the fact is, he's not... Um, we're told in First John that perfect love casteth out fear. Okay? Um, the fact is, did Moses fear God? I know that seems kind of a silly question. Right? I think the children of Israel under his rule, did they, did they fear God? Not always. No, not always. Not, not very consistently. Okay. So when we read in Deuteronomy 5, as far as what he was recounting to them, what they had told him to tell God, and then God tells him to tell them with regard to the fact that, hey, you guys stated very clearly that, yeah, you know, it's a terrible thing who's seen God and lived, or who's heard the voice of God and lived, and then so he's like, okay, fine, I'm going to let you guys have the go-between, and then it's, yes. So I was thinking that fear in God, the only the only evidence we have of fear in God is, is when we obey him. And you can look at Moses' life and you can say he feared God almost all of his life except when he struck the rock, obviously rebelled there. But uh, the people of Israel only obey God periodically, but I think you can you can equate fear with obedience. You wouldn't have to be afraid of him destroying you or coming down, as we think. We think, okay, like you with a lightning bolt or you know whacking you over the head with a bat or something like that. Uh, if you had a relationship with him, I mean, the fact is, okay, we as humans, I at this point here is that you can draw an eye, right? He's not going to destroy you. That's not what he wants to do. He came to give life and life more abundant. Uh, I, I know Christ said that in particular as far as when he was here in his earthly ministry, but he still hasn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he still desires to do the same. Uh, he wants to have a relationship, and he's the one that makes, takes actually the first step and made everything available, or made it to where everybody can uh, draw an eye to him and said, we, we don't. And by and large, it's because we want to remain in our center. We want to hide our center. You know, we don't want to deal with our sin. We'd rather have our sin than be close to God. And so we can have <coughs> access. It's available to us, and we're actually admonished to, hey, you know, um, we have the, the idea of the word bold there, it's it's like a liberty. It'd be the difference between, like, uh, you know, how, how many of y'all have ever been to, like, the White House? Like, ever taken, a, like, a tour of it? Were you guys able to go into Oval Office? They're, they're part of the tour? Who did we? No. We did we Oh, they didn't allow We entered through the China Room. Oh, but they never actually took you guys into it? No, they took us through the China Room. Okay. With all the presidential Chinas on display. Was there a sitting president at the time? President in -house? Reagan. Okay. What, was he in house at the time or no? Not sure. Um, okay. But they do limit access depending on where the president is and things like that. So We had to go to our congresswoman to get the tickets. Okay. And I think that's still how you do it. Okay. I know there's going to be some people that would have uh, no sense of decorum, I guess, about him or whatever, but like, would you guys <laughs> just kind of like waltz on in there like, hey, you know, this is my place. Kick your feet up on his desk. <laughs> You probably, it would be difficult to get through the security to begin with. Let's say you had that ability to be able to go in. You know, not very many people would. You might have some people that are bold and brash like that, but you don't, you know? Now, do you have that kind of difficulty when you go into your own house, to your living room, or to your bedroom? No, why? Because it's, it's your place. This is my place. I come in and I can do whatever I want. This is my place. The throne room of God, is, <laughs> it's, that's our place, you know? Holiest of holies. Now mind you, it's you know, not out here, there's the holiest of holies in heaven, direct access before the presence of holy God. That's home. That's just as much home as is, you know, my bedroom, my living room, you know, my kitchen and stuff. And we, you know, I can just go in there as, you know, I mean, <clears throat> obviously there's a sense of decorum coming before holy God, but the fact is that's just as much, and I don't have to be fearful, or and, and I don't have restriction 
And so the thing is, I have as much access to that as I would. Yes, sir. That's true, but when we appear before God in heaven, we're going to fall down at his feet and worship him. He's going to give us crowns. We're going to cast them at his feet. So we're going to worship him, which means to bow down and reverence him for all eternity. Yeah. Yes, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying as far as our ability to be able to go ahead and come before the presence of God, even now. It, now. And that's the admonition. We have that. And we have that liberty to be able to go ahead and do so. So now we're taking advantage of it. So draw an eye to God. You know, you've, I don't think in history you've ever really had that uh, prior, prior to Christ rising from the dead. You know, offering himself and then rising from the dead. So you have that now. Yes. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews uh, 4.16 says we're to come boldly before the throne of grace. And I picture that as, yes, we can come before the king, just like Esther came before the king when he held up the scepter to her. But we, don't, we can't do it presumptuously either. We, we still need to recognize when we come to God, we're coming before the, his throne of the, 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 of the highest. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's the boss, not me. But we're, we're, we're admonished here. Draw an eye. Uh, then hold fast the profession of our faith and then as well as uh, consider, let it provoke one another to love and to good works. The idea of provoking is like to stir up. Like, you know, you're stoking a fire. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the thing is, I have that privilege now, so take advantage of it. And part of, part of the way we go ahead and provoke one another, stir one another up is, you got to be around each other, <laughs> you know? So don't forsake the assembling of yourself. Uh, you know, come to church. Uh, take advantage of the fellowship that you have here. You know, you hear from God, but as well as, you know, you got the brethren that are here to, you know, encourage and admonish one another. That, hey, look, draw an eye to God. Keep walking with the Lord. Uh, you know, you can do it. God's worked in my life. You can work in yours. Uh, and so the fact is, we have a priesthood. You know, we have ability to and direct access to God that's unprecedented in any other time in history. Uh, and the fact is that uh, we, we need to take advantage of that. I hate the point. All right, does anybody have any questions? Nope. All right, so next week we'll be looking at two officers, two officers, the T and the acrostic. Which is uh, pastor and deacon, and then what the Bible has to say about that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, if no other questions, we're dismissed. <clears throat> Thank you, brother Charlie. You make us think. Oh. <laughs>